والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه ومن والاه أيها الإخوة المسلمون في كل مكان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وبعد نتوجه برسالة اليوم لأهلنا في شان الرباط والجهاد والعزة والعروبة والكرامة شام الانتفاض على الذل شام التصدي للظلم والظالمين شام التضحية والفداء شام الرفعة والإباء فأقول لهم سلام عليكم أيها الأحبة الأبطال سلام عليكم أيها المجاهدون الآمرون بالمعروف والناهون عن المنكر سلام عليكم أيها المظلومون المقهورون المعذبون Good afternoon everybody Today the government of Libya announced the death of Muammar Gaddafi This marks the end of a long and painful chapter for the people of Libya You have won your revolution and now we will be a partner as you forge a future that provides dignity, freedom, and opportunity. Assad will leave power. Assad is standing in their way. And everyone can speculate about that, what that would mean for President Assad. Uh, this is more the prescription for how to deal with the world. What are the forces at play in the world today? A question? that remains unanswered by those entrusted to communicate to us the truth. Yet, we ourselves fall short from attaining it, not for lack of access, but because of an unbroken fear that has obscured our vision. They stand as heroes, but in fact are our destroyers, operating behind the shadows of a grand scheme larger than the destruction they themselves conceive. The goal is imperial domination, and only few have risen against them. The goal is total control in a situation where their own cause is defeating them. The goal comes from no nation, but an outside force that has taken them hostage. Who their players are, we must know now if we are to defeat them. Yet the question remains, will we do so in time, before it becomes too late for yourselves, for your family, your children, and civilization? This is the true story of Syria. I am personally shocked and horrified by the tragic incident in Hula two days ago, which took so many innocent lives, children, women, and men. This was an appalling crime, and the Security Council has rightly condemned it. And I extend my profound condolences the public mind has been drowned out by shouts from the Western sphere of influence, led by former British Prime Minister Tony Blair's doctrine of responsibility to protect, with complicity from the U.S. governments of George W. Bush, continued by President Barack Obama. Hoisting the flag of humanitarian intervention, the U.S., with obscure evidence provided by Tony Blair's British government in 2003, invaded Iraq. Similar allegations for protecting the people of foreign lands brought about the international 
military involvement in the war in Libya in 2011 and the Kosovo-Serbian fiasco during the late 1990s. In these cases, under shouts for annihilating a brutal dictatorial regime, which in fact most of them were, false evidence was provided, U.S. constitutional laws violated, all in the name of toppling dictatorial regimes under the auspices of protecting their civilians. In the circumstances that we faced then, but I think even if you look back now, it was better to deal with this threat, to deal with it, to remove him from office. And I do genuinely believe that the world is safer as a result. I believe he threatened. Not it is under this scope but the world. by which we are to examine what occurred in Hula, Syria, May 25th, 2012. Um, this particular um, tragedy has again drawn the attention of the world to what is happening in Syria. Для нас совершенно не является главным, кто является во власти в Сирии, какой режим в Сирии. Главное для нас обеспечить прежде всего прекращение любого насилия. Relevant opposition uh, forces in Syria. And that is what we are all united about doing. И когда uh, некоторые наши партнеры, особенно из числа uh, стран, которые расположены ближе к Сирии, чем Россия или Великобритания, начинают говорить, что только смена режима решит проблему, у меня возникает сомнение в искренности их заявлений о том, что uh, они хотят. Uh, прекратить насилие, помочь прекратить насилие. In the wake of the Hula massacre, Russia, the strongest proponent for carrying out Kofi Annan's six-point peace plan since he was appointed UN Arab League peace envoy to Syria in late February, led a crucial battle during the weekend of the massacre to determine with conclusive evidence what had actually happened in the brutal events of May 25th. Russia called an emergency session of the United Nations Security Council two days later on a Sunday afternoon. The UNSC received a briefing from Norwegian General Robert Mood, head of the 200-plus UN observer mission deployed into Syria as part of the Anon peace plan, where he told members of the Permanent Security Council, plus a representative from Germany, that the evidence was, quote, murky as to who led the slaughter against civilians in Syria. But despite the general's caution that at the moment no conclusion can be made as to who was at fault, and with the Russians and a UNSC letter stating that an investigation is required, not a second passed from the adjournment of the UNSC closed-door meeting before the French, British, and German envoys raced to the microphones in the press area, concluding for the public Assad was undeniably to blame. While UN ambassadors went a step further to blame the Syrian government. From Germany... There is a clear footprint of the government in this massacre. The Council has issued a strong and united condemnation of the mass killings of civilians on the 25th of May in El Hula, including by artillery, shelling and tank fire from the Syrian regime. That the Syrian government Russian Deputy Envoy Alexander Pankin was left to explain calmly to the media the true accounts delivered by General Mood, clarifying that the general had established evidence of tanks being present in Hula, a claim used by the British sphere of influence to say those were the footprints of the regime's involvement. But that Mood did not link tank shellings to the number of deaths. In fact, according to accounts, most of the over 100 massacre in Hula were killed at close range. Pankin then raised what the British faction of the West and Arab region 
wished would have remained unsaid. There is a third force terrorist or foreign intervention at play. Yes, there are. There is a third element, or there are third elements, and these people are not committed to the cause of the Syrian people. They are committed to their own agenda. So Herb Latsius made these remarks four days before Hula. However, hours before the atrocity, State Department spokesperson Victoria Nuland recalled the right to enforce Chapter 7, the UN Security Council clause, to invoke foreign military intervention by air, land, and sea in the event that Anand's plan proved to be a failure. That it's time, the Secretary's made clear, it's going to be Chapter 7 At the same next. time, every day, dozens of people are getting killed. Was it this third force Lazio has warned of days before the massacre? Who waged the massacre? How could we know? When the British and German envoys screamed Assad to the press before any investigation was allowed to take place. Assad screamed vociferously, drowning General Robert Mood's conclusion that the evidence was murky. We would do that with our allies, bearing in mind, of course, what can be secured at the UN Security Council and what is practical and effective. So we're not ruling anything out, but a military intervention in Syria, as I've always pointed out, would have to be vastly greater in scale than was the case in Libya. There seems to me to be only one other alternative. Members of the international community are left with uh, the option only of having to consider whether they're pre prepared to take actions outside of the Annan plan and the authority of this council. Within 24 hours of Russia's emergency closed-door meeting, a Syrian rebel spokesman proclaimed that the massacre now justified the opposition's right to end their commitment to a non-ceasefire, playing right into the hands of what had been the intent of the British with complicity of the U.S. Obama government before and after the atrocity, an end to Kofi Annan's peace plan. If an investigation would have led to the truth that Bashar al-Assad's regime indeed was to blame for the massacre, no investigation at the time was even allowed to be carried out to discover if it was true. To reaffirm one of the oldest, one of the strongest alliances the world has ever seen. A few days after the hideous bloodbath in the Syrian city of Hula, 11-year-old Ali al-Sayed suddenly became famous in the Arab media. When armed men invaded the house of his family in Hula and murdered all the members of his family in cold blood, little Ali also dropped to the ground. The blood of his dead mother, who lay next to him, colored his clothes red. This saved his life because the murderers thought that Ali was also dead. It is striking that the 11-year-old Ali twice described the murderers of his family as men with shaved heads and long beards. This definitely does not fit the soldiers of the Syrian army, but rather points in the direction of... According the to eyewitness testimonies, pictures. the massacre happened during the time frame after the Friday prayers, when Sunni rebels attacked three Syrian army checkpoints around Hula. Despite the fact that Hula has a more than 90% Sunni population, almost exclusively families from the Alawi and Shia minorities in Hula were killed. Those killed include members of the Alawi family Shomalia and the family of a Sunni member of parliament, since he was considered as a government collaborator. Immediately after the massacre, the culprits filmed their victims, representing them as Sunni victims and distributing the videos on the internet. Are the preferred targets of hidden terrorism by the armed resistance. Taxi drivers, street vendors, mailmen, especially civil functionaries, were innocent victims of acts that went from simple assassination to gratuitous barbarity. Their throats were slashed, mutilated, cut into pieces, thrown into street corners or public trash cans. These acts of atrocity were then exploited by the media to impute the responsibility to the government forces. We were taken by surprise ourselves by this tactic.
during a visit to Holmes. A man had just been attacked by part of the armed gangs because he refused to close his shop. His car was blown up and he was literally hacked to pieces and tossed under the storefront window. At the moment we were coming by, passers-by opened their mobile phones and were filming, and we overheard one of them say, doubtless talking to one of the satellite TV networks, this is what Syrian citizens endure at the hands of Bashar al-Assad's death squads. We photographed this event. We then proceeded to take the body of this poor killed man to the hospital. Instead of bringing help to the murdered person, the onlookers filmed it, getting Al Jazeera to believe that the state had perpetrated the crime. Saudi Arabia and other Persian Gulf monarchies and emirates provide an estimated $500 billion a year to radical Salafi networks, including the various Al-Qaeda groupings that are engaged in violent destabilizations, including the ongoing armed rebel operations in Syria. In recent weeks, these funds have facilitated a flow of weapons and paid foreign mercenaries into Syria via bordering countries, including Iraq, Lebanon, and Turkey. The concentration of black market weapons along the Syrian borders is unprecedented. Arms traffickers are becoming millionaires overnight. Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states are bankrolling the recruitment, arming, and deployment of Sunni mercenaries who are being sent into Syria to fight against the Assad government and the Syrian security forces. Experts have little confidence the Arab League and United Nations peace plan initiated by Special Envoy Kofi Annan will actually result in a... It was on February 2012 that Kofi Annan was appointed UN Arab League Special Envoy to Syria in an attempt to stop the violence. A month later, his six-point peace plan was submitted to the United Nations, traveling on the 24th of March to Moscow to secure strong Russian support for the effort. Point two of the plan, before any other steps could take place, demanded a ceasefire on the part of both the opposition fighters and the Syrian regime. But Kofi Annan should have been told, you are dealing with a third element, not two. A third force, void of national loyalty, distilled from three key players, Saudi Arabia, the UK, and the United States. The Anon plan isn't failing. It is under attack. When you see a lot of money in Syria, then you believe, I believe that Saudis. The shadow of Syria now, is a military military. It means that the military is in a military أدوات عسكري بطابع أمني يعني كل هذا الطيف الذي تشهده سوريا هو أدوات عسكري لكنه بطابع أمني استخباراتي هذا نظام ما بيهمه لا العالم ولا أي شيء يعني يعني الموضوع أكبر من موضوع النظام ليه لأنه النظام مدعوم أصلا دوليا ومدعوم من قبل إسرائيل أصلا We are completely against arming the uprising as well as we are against foreign intervention. We declared that very clear, very loud. Left unspoken by the British and Obama administration anti-Syrian regime chorus is the fact that their highly praised Gulf partner, the monarchical government of Saudi Arabia, not only has expressed the desire to arm the rebellion, but desire Olivia repeat. 
few have exposed or accused not only that they intended, but already are and in fact have been funding terrorist networks now said to have infiltrated the region before the uprising ever occurred to the tune of $500 billion a year. Left unspoken, not out of ignorance, but out of an unofficial commitment to a global imperial agenda in place since September 11, 2001. I want to welcome uh, His Majesty uh, King Abdullah to the White House. إذا علم أنه سيصل إلى هؤلاء وصولا جيدا بأمانة ودقة فلا شك إن شاء الله أنه جهاد في سبيل الله لأن ما قوى شوكة هؤلاء وأضعف شوكة هؤلاء مطلوب شرعا During the uprising, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf neighbors said to be hiring mercenaries to operate in Syria have since established refugee camps within Turkey's borders. Through their Islamic Relief Agency and with Saudi Army medical staff, they have been operating these camps with assistance by Turkish authorities. What goes on inside these camps? Almost no one can verify. International organizations are not allowed to enter them as they are prevented by Turkish authorities. The argument is that the refugees are not under refugee status. They are guests and therefore not covered by international refugee conventions. What goes on within these camps, therefore, is the business of the Saudis, some Turks, their guests, no one else. In the same day the Saudi Arabia's Grand Mufti, Al-Ashik, preached jihad for sake of Allah against the Syrian government, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, in a meeting in Riyadh with his Jordanian counterpart, proposed negotiations with the Jordanian king to permit weapons shipments into Syria in exchange for economic assistance. Publicly, the exchange was said not to have been accepted though a Jordanian official commented that the position was unlikely to remain, saying, We are a non-interventionist country, but if it becomes force majeure, you have to join. Well, I think that it is pretty clear that the rebels have been receiving, receiving arms from abroad, and Syrian television has been showing almost daily shipments of arms being smuggled into Syria uh, via Lebanon, uh, Turkey, and other uh, border crossings. نحن منذ البداية رفضنا التدخل في الشأن الداخلي لسوريا لأن التدخل السوري والتدخل الخارجي في الشؤون السورية لن يخدم سوريا لا حكومة ولا شعبا التدخل الخارجي سيزيد من تعقيد الأزمة لذلك قلنا أن الحوار هو الحل الوحيد كمخرج للأزمة السورية نحن عندما رأينا موقف روسيا كان موقفا حكيما موقف الصين لأن فعلا التدخل الخارجي ولنا أمثلة كثيرة في المنطقة عندنا أمثلة كثيرة في المنطقة إلى أين أدى التدخل الخارجي العسكري في شؤون دول هل أدى إلى الاستقرار هل لغاية الآن في أفغانستان بعد مرور أكثر من عشر سنوات هل ستب الاستقرار والأمن في أفغانستان أبدا Few have dared to come forward under the condition of anonymity, warning that the Saudis are beyond negotiations and public annunciations for jihad against Syria. They are, in fact, working behind the shadows they themselves cast to feed the conflict, sabotaging Anand's peace effort. A top Arab diplomat 
revealed in publications on March 17th that Saudi Arabia was in the process of delivering equipment to rebel fighters in an effort to militarily overpower the Syrian army. The weapons would be traveling through Jordan, where it was admitted later that Saudi King Abdullah in fact did discuss with the King of Jordan. Later, a Western diplomat in Ankara, Turkey, stepped forward and leaked that rebel fighters are being armed by Saudi Arabia and their Gulf state neighbor Qatar. The diplomat disclosed, though at first, anti-regime activists only smuggled small quantities of light weapons purchased on the black market in Hatay of southern Turkey and brought to Syria's Idlib province. As of late May 2012, the loose assortment of rebel groups had received multiple shipments of arms that included AK-47s, BKC machine guns, rocket-propelled grenades, and anti-tank weaponry from the monarchies of the Gulf. From Ankara, the Western official cautioned, Officially, no one will admit it. Nonetheless, the weapons provided by Saudi Arabia and Qatar are going through Turkey with Turkish intelligence units fully aware as they are responsible for vetting who is eligible to receive arms and who is not. A vetting procedure that both U.S. officials and Arab intelligence officers have informed journalists that a small number of CIA officers in southern Turkey are similarly involved in. All intersecting the unverified activities of Saudi Arabia's Islamic relief camp and their guests. وإيقاف دزيف الدم والتمسك بالحل السياسي والحوار الوطني ورفض التدخل الأجنبي في الأزمة السورية التي تعيشها الشعوب العربية المنطقة العربية هنا يفه أن يساهم في الحفاظ على أراضيها وسيادتها الإقليم التي تعيشها الشعوب العربية لا أحد يريد الإضرار بسوريا ونحن نعم مع فكرة تسليح المعارضة التي تقاتل من أجل حريتها وحياتها ناخش وأيضا المنطقة العازلة هل ستناخش وأن هناك واضح خلاف بين الطرف تبغى تدخل بيننا خلاف وما في خلاف هذا شيء ثاني بس قلنا يعني دول النقاط الأربعة إيش بتقول إيش بتقول Prince Saud Al Faisal's declared duty was followed with his Qatar partners hosting an announcement by businessmen in the Qatari capital, the creation of a $300 million fund for the rebellion. Though announced in June, Wael Mirza, one of the sponsors of the fund, admitted that the fund had been established long ago, for months, to, quote, support all components of the revolution. However, this figure is merely a drop in the bucket in comparison to the yearly $500 billion channel of money flows to overall Salafists and Al-Qaeda-linked groupings from the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia. It is within this backdrop that Syrian expert in strategic affairs, Salim Harba, disclosed that the arrests of 700 gunmen in Babur Amr in early March were composed of gunmen from the Gulf states, Iraq, Lebanon, with Qatari intelligence agents among them. Salim said these men were stripped of weapons made in Europe, America, and Israel, including Israeli grenades, night binoculars, and communication systems. 
60,000 rounds of ammunition were also confiscated in Lebanon around the same period, found hidden within two vehicles on board an Italian container ship. Intercepted in the Mediterranean Sea, like the seizure in Babur Amr, officials found rocket-propelled grenades and heavy caliber ammunition. Permanent members of the Security Council using their veto when people are being murdered, it is just despicable. And I ask, whose side are they on? They are clearly not on the side of the Syrian people. Why has so much attention been given towards the Russians as the purveyors of injustice? When the mounting evidence is clear that our eyes should be focused on Saudi Arabia and understanding why the conflict in Syria has yet to cease. Were the arms confiscated, part of the overall Saudi plan, left intentionally unnoticed by the UK and US? Perhaps was it simply just Saud al Faisal's duty? Pack editors discovered through announcements made January 14, 2012, in the heat of the Syrian crisis, that British Prime Minister David Cameron met with King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia in a one-day visit to Riyadh. The British Prime Minister's office in Downing Street disclosed that the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the importance of the United Kingdom-Saudi bilateral relationship agreeing to strengthen cooperation in a range of areas from that already in existence. They also shared concerns about the situation in Syria. Most telling was revealed by former British ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Sir Alan Munro, who told Sky News, it is very important that David Cameron takes this opportunity to reestablish the sort of mutual confidence at the top level that its predecessors, ever since Margaret Thatcher, have sustained with Saudi Arabia as an important partner. It was then noted that British defense manufacturer BAE Systems has interest in Saudi Arabia, which at the time of the meeting were working to expand a large typhoon Eurofighter contract with the Saudis. What was revealed was acknowledgement that the nature of the meeting between Cameron and King Abdullah was to sustain a mutual confidence initiated by former British Prime Minister now, Margaret Thatcher. Shocked, but composed and determined, is 
Thatcher's initiation was with Saudi Prince Bandar bin Sultan in 1985, the Al Yamama deal involving BAE systems. Bandar, Thatcher, BAE, all tied to a slush fund deal that intersects and directly traces to the financing of two of the hijackers of September 11, 2001. Nawaf al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Madar were two of the five terrorists who hijacked American Airlines Flight 77, crashing it into the Pentagon. They both were harbored by two Saudi intelligence operatives, Amar al-Bayomi and Osama Basnan. In the course of four years leading up to September 2001, al-Bayomi and Basnan were transferred between fifty-one to seventy-three thousand dollars in checks and cashier checks from Prince Bandar and his wife, Princess Haifa bint Faisal. Haifa transferred the money to the wife of Osama Basnan, then by procedure transferred the money to the bank account of Omar al-Bayomi, deposited by his wife, Majira Dwaikit. Bayomi is known to have paid for housing and flight training lessons for the two hijackers of American Airline Flight 77. However, the tens of thousands of dollars transferred in Saudi May's fashion that made its way to Nawif al-Hazmi and Khalid al-Madar all originated from a bank account at Riggs National Bank in Washington, D.C., owned by Prince Bandar bin Sultan. Our decision to start negotiating the purchase of a substantial number of aircrafts for our national airline. I am also Prince Bandar was greeted by an undesired reality when in 2007, the story had erupted that he, since his arms for oil deal with Margaret Thatcher in 1985, had enjoyed $2 billion in kickbacks and bribes, a deal made between the Saudi prince and the British with a friendly handshake. However, the overall Al Yamama deal for BAE weapons in exchange for Saudi oil during the 22 year span between 1985 and 2007 shored up $80 billion to $100 billion that was never accounted for. Money from the Al Yamama deal has been traced to clandestine operations, to arms purchased from Egypt and sent to the beginning stages of Al Qaeda, the Mujahideen. Tens and thousands of dollars were directly given to two of the 9 11 hijackers whose funds originated in the same bank account of Saudi Prince Bandar for 22 years received billions of dollars for brokering the Al Yamama BAE for Saudi oil exchange with British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. Two weeks before the 9-11 hijackings, a wealthy Saudi family who had been in contact with Mohammed Atta and other of the 9-11 hijackers abruptly fled from their luxury home near Sarasota, Florida. This raises further questions about the Saudi links to the hijackers. The house was owned by Saudi financier Isam Ghazawi and was occupied by his daughter Anud and her husband Abdul Aziz Alhiji. Law enforcement agents found records of telephone calls with a number of the 9-11 hijackers Mohammed Atta included, and security records of the gated community also showed visits by vehicles owned by Atta and another 2B hijacker, Zayed Jara. Atta, Jara, and Marwan al Shihi were all living within 10 miles of Ghazawi's house and were taking flying lessons in nearby Venice, Florida. Analysis of phone records from Ghazawi's house showed contact with 11 other terrorism suspects, including Walid al Shihi, who was with Atta on the first plane to hit the World Trade Center in New York City on September 11th. Yes, people do know where they stand with us. Yes, they do know we're strong government. Yes, they do know we have a...
the operation thrived by the logistics of a BAE slush fund, a deal that represented one of the biggest funding pools in history for global covert operations, protected by Her Majesty Elizabeth II's Official Secrets Act, with its finances guarded by the highly unregulated system within the city of London's square mile and offshore havens under British dominion. An operation left unobstructed by David Cameron and King Abdullah's arrangements during the heat of the Syrian crisis. The UK are involved in creating the slush fund deal. The US, under two administrations, has behaved with complicity. Why then would these same forces ever to have bothered to seek out the truth of who actually led the massacre in Hula, Syria, May 25th? The US never even bothered to investigate how their partners of the UK and Saudi Arabia carried the attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. in the morning of September 11, 2001. هذا هو النظام الشرير الذي تواجهه الأمة المسلمة داخل سوريا وخارجها وهو نظام سرطاني خبيث يخنق الأحرار في سوريا ويطاردهم خارجها ولا علاج معه إلا الاستئصال ومن حق أهلنا في سوريا ومن حق الأمة كلها أن تستخدم ما تراه من وسائل لاستئصاله إذا أردنا الحرية فيجب أن نتحرر من هذا النظام وإذا أردنا العدالة فيجب أن نقتص من هذا النظام وإذا أردنا الاستقلال فيجب أن نقف في وجه هذا النظام وإذا أردنا الحرية فيجب أن نزيح هذا النظام يا أسود الشام жестокого врага. Все мы обязаны помнить, почему началась война, и анализировать ее уроки. Ведь они по-прежнему актуальны. И сегодня хочу подчеркнуть, строгое соблюдение международных норм, уважение государственного суверенитета и самостоятельного выбора каждого народа это одна из безусловных гарантий того, что трагедия прошедшей войны никогда больше не повторится. Россия последовательно проводит политику по укреплению безопасности в мире. What has stood in the way against the intended outcome of a global black ops operation has been the Russians and a minority of patriots within the United States. The desire is war. War because it is the only means by which the present international empire can maintain power as it deals with the harsh reality that its international financial system has reached an end. They would rather see a world engulfed by war, savage destruction and famine, 
then witness the rise of an alternative, asserted through the powers of national sovereignty against the ancient rule of monetary law. What you have been told about Syria is worse than a fabrication. It is a lie. It is not about Assad. It is not about Syria or simple regime change. It is about carrying out the intended outcome of September 11, 2001. It is about maintaining the unbroken process of the attacks as part of a global covert operation to preserve the immortal existence of the Roman Empire. You say, this sounds crazy? You need to grow up. Thank you. 